Well, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Cardoso. Um, so our, the panel uh, that we have today is uh, uniquely chosen in the sense that these panel members, uh, for the most part, represent a number of different countries, but they all are, have uh, extensive experience in Canada, for the most part, either are Canadians who went abroad or are people from abroad who've spent quite a bit of time here in Canada. So uh, we're hoping to get some interesting uh, insights on uh, how Canada compares in their experience with, uh, with the country that, that they're most familiar with. So I'm going to introduce the panel in the order that they appear in the program, which is uh, going to give the first word to Oak Ridge National Laboratories and the last word to the province of Ontario. Uh, so our panelists are uh, Tom Mason, who's the lab director at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Leo Oziaki, who's the deputy executive director of International Science and Technology Centre in Russia, but who was born in northern Ontario, um, and uh, Tom was born in the Maritimes, uh, Yeya Al-Khazraj, who's the Director of Academic Relations in, for the Saudi Arabian Cultural Bureau. Philip Marksgut, who's the Director and Attaché for Science and Technology with the Embassy of Austria. Patricio Powell, who's the Council General, the Council General of Chile in Toronto. And Bill Mantle, who's the Acting Assistant Deputy Minister at the Ministry of Research and Innovation, Science and Research Division with the Government of Ontario. So with that, let me turn it over to Tom for your remarks. I think much of the discussion this morning in looking at the government role in international collaborations has, has focused on what you might call the programmatic side of things. How can you structure research programs that will bring together uh, scientists and engineers from different parts of the world to focus on problems of common interest. And we've heard some of the challenges with that in terms of the, you know, differing structures of research enterprises and, and so forth. But um, I would argue that at some level, that's almost the easy part of the activity since, it, you know, you start by trying to identify a common interest. So if uh, you know, the U.S. was seeking collaboration with Brazil, we might discover that we're both interested in the sustainability of biofuels and then build a program uh, of co-investment where, by and large, most of our investment would be domestic and we're really coordinating and aligning our investments to encourage our researchers to work together. Um, I guess what I'd like to uh, discuss a little bit is a topic which I think is trickier uh, but is one that possibly to an even greater extent demands international collaboration, and that is uh, large facilities and major inf research infrastructure uh, that exceeds the capacity of any one nation to execute what one of my predecessors, Alvin Weinberg, uh, coined the phrase big science. Um, we have a number of very successful examples of this, of course, uh, most recently, we've all been excited to watch the results begin to come out of the LHC at CERN and the really tremendous performance of the accelerator and the detectors there and the excitement that's creating in that community. Uh, but most of these have been rather one-off ad hoc arrangements. Uh, they differ in their governance, they differ in their funding, and, and in particular, they differ in the way in which the very idea was germinated. Uh, there have been efforts like the OECD Mega Science Forum to try and coordinate these discussions internationally, uh, but it's rather difficult to get um, coherence. Probably the best developed examples of major international facilities exist in the EU, but I'd actually argue that that situation is a little bit unique in that uh, that sort of research collaboration was actually an instrument to drive European integration and many of those facilities, although they involve multiple countries, uh, are uh, similar in construct to what would exist within the U.S. as a national facility. So that model is probably not portable uh, to, the, to the Western Hemisphere or, or to Asia because you don't have that European integration drive, at least, at least not at present. I think this is a topic that's particularly important for uh, countries like Canada, which, as we heard earlier, represent about four, represents about 4% of the contribution. I assume that's somehow measuring papers or patents or something. Um, uh, since since the, what would be the threshold for a national facility is obviously going to be lower in a country like Canada or Sweden 
uh, or, or the Philippines than it would be in Japan, uh, the U.S., or, or if you view the EU as a country. Um, and uh, there's also a bit of an inherent challenge that's uh, coming uh, increasingly visible, I would say, which is that this kind of international collaboration for large facilities was really initially formulated around uh, things like the particle physics endeavor with CERN. Uh, in fact, if you look at international collaboration in the Cold War uh, between the US and Russia, the topics that were chosen were specifically chosen because they were relatively uh, more distant from direct impact on things that might have been uh, elements of competition between those uh, two superpowers. They didn't have direct military or economic benefits, more on the fundamental science side, uh, but we're now seeing major facilities that are, are starting to get much closer to uh, the kind of applied R&D that has societal impacts that motivate uh, taxpayer investments. Um, but that also means that you've got to balance off those national interests since in the end economic development is an intrinsically local activity. Um, so I think there are some uh, interesting challenges there. Um, the, the thing I'd like to close with is, is a discussion maybe a little bit about an experiment that's underway right now, uh, which we're involved in since Oak Ridge is responsible for the U.S. contribution to ITER, which is a major uh, fusion experiment that's being built in Catarash. Uh, the, the, uh, most of the world is participating since you have China, Russia, the European Union, India, South Korea, uh, the U.S., um, it, has, it is now, I would say, launched. There's significant construction activities underway. The remaining major uh, technical issues are being resolved. Uh, but to be honest, it has been extraordinarily painful to get to this point. And in fact, I would say we're still not out of the woods because the final challenge that you face in the project like this is interleaving the budget processes of a number of different countries in very stressful times. Uh, so, uh, just to uh, look at the last year, uh, the EU is the major partner in ITER because it's the host country, uh, and uh, we all know the challenges, the economic challenges that are existing in Europe. Um, Japan has just experienced a major earthquake, which is having a big economic uh, impact, and in the U.S. we're having a big debate about uh, uh, the, the, the deficit. So how these budget processes will uh, line up so that all countries are meeting their contributions, I would say, is still an unsolved problem. Thank you, Tom. So, Leo, the view from Russia. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank my colleagues at McMaster University for the invitation to participate in this forum because I think it's very timely and it's not often you get to see um, such a blend of academia, uh, industry, uh, and government representatives uh, at a fairly high level who are engaged in this issue of uh, R&D in Canada and, and, and what to do with respect to uh, R&D at universities. Uh, secondly, just for clarification, I'm not here to talk about Russian science. Uh, I'm not only a Canadian, I'm actually Canada's shall we say, leading edge in international collaboration in Russia and uh, the former Soviet Union states, uh, and have lived and worked there as Canada's nominee for about the last 14 years. Um, and connected to that, other than the comments by my uh, fellow panelist, uh, Tom Mason, I just found it very odd, but interesting as well, that in all of the presentations yesterday and in all the discussions about the top science countries of which many presentations listed seven or eight of them, Russia was never mentioned, not one time. And I find that interesting because yes, they had a difficult decade and they regressed uh, significantly in the 90s, but we ourselves work with over 100,000 of the top former Soviet uh, scientists in over 650 research institutes and university. And I kind of think that's the first point I'd like to make. If you're talking about Canada and international collaboration, the fact that you've sort of missed this country um, is just a point that I'd like to bring out. 
So anyways, what I'd like to do is, is highlight some of the positive ways that uh, the Canadian government has supported international collaboration through my own organization. Uh, but at the same time, because we have been on the front lines of this, I'd like to also address um, some of the objectives of this forum uh, by highlighting uh, shortcomings, uh, I'll say, or weaknesses that I think can still be addressed to improve and enhance uh, government's role in international collaboration. Uh, so firstly, uh, I have to spend one or two minutes uh, putting things in context by telling you who we are and what we, what we do. Uh, the ISTC, it's a bit of a misnomer, uh, the International Science and Technology Center, uh, is headquartered in Moscow and we were born in 1994, one of two unique centers uh, created through unique international treaties when the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, and we had a very simple primary objective, and that was to engage the former weapons of mass destruction scientists on peaceful applications uh, of their knowledge. Uh, Canada joined this center uh, in Moscow in 2004, although uh, they were founding members of our smaller sister center uh, headquartered in Kiev, and which I headed for five years uh, uh, from the late 90s. Uh, we have 39 countries and 450 partners that provide our funding. And our partners include private sector companies, universities, government agencies, um, scientific uh, organizations such as CERN, such as the European Space Agency, uh, and it goes on and on. Since our founding, we've invested one billion U.S. dollars supporting 75,000 scientists on over 3,000 high-tech R&D projects uh, in every technology area that there is. Uh, now, universities, I'd say, have formed one of the foundations for our activities uh, by engaging with us as collaborators uh, through their researchers. In our network, we have over 3,000 university departments and institutes globally which provide us with these collaborators. Now, to put things in context, in Canada, of these 3,000, uh, we have 382 researchers from about 36 universities from uh, about 158 departments in these 36 universities. And they collaborate on over 130 projects in Russia, in Central Asia, and in the Caucasus and Belarus. Now the Canadian government, and in this case the Canadian government is DFATE, um, through NSERC uh, supports us by identifying experts who uh, end up collaborating on these research projects for us uh, in these countries. Uh, we have funds where we will pay these collaborators to come to the visit the laboratories on the projects, whether it's in Tajikistan or Kyrgyzstan. And in every project, we ensure that there's a significant travel budget so that uh, the CIS scientists can reciprocate and come to Canada and spend time in your laboratories uh, working with you. Uh, and this is great, but it only represents what I consider the beginning of what it's possible to do with us uh, with respect to collaboration. And I'm going to give you an example of what I'm talking about. The United States has 1,200 university departments working with us. The European <coughs> Union has 1,500 university departments and institutes working with us. Uh, we have 20 university partners in Korea, Japan, the US, Europe, and one from Canada, and it happens to be McMaster, and I'm, I'm pleased to say that I think that reflects McMaster being actually one of the leading universities when it comes to what I would consider real international collaboration. Now the point I'm trying to make is, of our 450 partners, in the United States, every national laboratory is our partner, uh, the CDC, the NIH, every department in the United States, Department of Defense, Department of Energy, DHHS, Department of Agriculture, Homeland Security, Department of Justice, the EPA, they are all our partners, which means they target research and development in these countries and they pay for it. This is real collaboration. This is the next level of collaboration from what's presently done in terms of 
reviewing work plans, emailing each other, and maybe visiting each other uh, once a year. Now, all of these partners I've just described in the United States, and, and the similar uh, applies to the European Union and all of their countries, and Japan and Korea, who are part of our organization. They all have spending authorities to allow paying for international research in other countries or they get the money from the Department of State, which is flowed through these government agencies and organizations. Now in Canada, for 14 years, I've been trying to bring in other ministries as partners, agencies, CANMET, many other organizations. It does not seem possible to do because of either Treasury Board restrictions or simply the policies which, which are fine because they're developed to support Canadian scientists, but we're missing the boat on this next level of collaboration. Because it's this next level of collaboration that's going to allow you to negotiate intellectual property deals with these institutes. Um, you're going to be commercializing and licensing together with them, and this is where the payoff really comes in. Uh, for me, it's all about leveraging. It's not about replacing uh, Canadian scientists with Russian or other scientists. It's about combining to address industry needs in Canada, research needs, your capabilities with, in some cases, much more sophisticated capabilities uh, in, in Russia or these other countries to, in effect, provide the R&D at, I would say, 30% lower cost than if you did it by yourself. And the best example I use is in the area of nuclear physics. Um, I said to someone yesterday, in Canada, I don't know now how many accelerators you have, three, four, something like that. I don't think there are that many. Uh, in Russia, I have institutes that have five accelerators, one institute. And basically, if you partner with them, you have unlimited use, you don't have time restrictions, and they're providing the in-cost uh, access to their equipment and materials which would significantly reduce your own uh, costs in terms of delivering research and development. So enough about that. Um, another area which I think uh, could be improved uh, relates to the hundreds of peer-reviewed proposals that we provide our government. Uh, we provide them to all of our funding governments. Now, because our funding is tied to non-proliferation and security objectives, uh, what happens is the, there are many very highly rated proposals because I often get complaints from Canadian uh, collaborators, researchers, that their projects aren't being funded. Uh, but that's because this money is tied to non-proliferation. And it's not just good science or great commercial potential uh, of the projects. But where we seem to fall down is we have these proposals at NSERC, who I believe are contracted to review them, but somehow they don't get passed on if they're not uh, approved for funding from the security side of things. Some of them may have exceptionally good potential for collaborative uh, commercial inventions or technology developments, and they're not passed on, I don't believe, to our universities and to the rest of our scientific community to see if they might be interested in funding as a partner some of these uh, projects. And finally, uh, because I think I'm using up my time, um, despite offering these and other opportunities to Canadian universities and Canadian private sector companies for over 15 years, nobody seems to know about us. You know, or Canada's major role in S&T R&D in Russia and in the Caucasus and in Central Asia. Uh, every time, the few times I get to Canada and talk about this, everyone's always astounded that Canada not only is involved in doing this, but has been doing this for 14 or 15 years. So in summary, is there a role for government in, promo in promoting R&D collaborations? Uh, I would say a resounding yes, uh, and, is, and I think Canada is doing a great job. Can it be improved? Again, I think uh, a resounding yes. But I think what we need to look at is uh, the, the policy side of things uh, in the government, this, this niche area of how can universities use, or even government ministry, other ministries and agencies use money to actually pay 
uh, international researchers when it can still be of great advantage to Canadian uh, R&D. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Leo. Yeah, yeah, from Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, indeed, uh, honored uh, to speak to you today uh, briefly about the uh, scholarship program, um, the King Abdullah Scholarship Program that's been uh, uh, established uh, 2005. Uh, since the uh, inauguration of King Abdullah to the throne of Saudi Arabia, uh, his government has embarked uh, upon uh, a short to a medium strategic plan to di diversify, diversify the uh, Saudi economy from an oil-based economy to a knowledge-based one. Um, several uh, measures have been introduced. I'm here just to tell you about part of it, which is the scholarship program. Um, currently, we have over 100,000 students all over the world in leading universities as part to uh, prepare uh, and develop Saudi human resources uh, to go back eventually to the country to help in building that goal uh, of uh, a knowledge-based uh, economy. The uh, Saudi Arabia experience in uh, sending students abroad, it's actually um, a rather long uh, experience. It started in the 1927, uh, where only 12 students were sent to a neighboring country, namely Egypt, uh, followed by a handful of students uh, to some other neighboring countries. Uh, in the early 1950s, we started to go beyond the neighboring Arab countries, uh, where we sent students to Europe and to the States in the 1950s, uh, again in a, a small uh, cohort of students. Uh, in the 70s, the number has increased, and the focus was on high, uh, higher education. Uh, but this uh, unique um, uh, program of King Abdullah Scholarship Program that was established 2005, um, it went beyond uh, the limited number uh, and the scope of the, um, of, of the scholarship itself. Uh, Currently in Canada, for instance, we have uh, over 16,000 uh, students. Uh, 13,000 are what we call them the major scholarship students, those who are engaged on uh, academic uh, uh, degrees. Uh, the remaining 3,000 are their dependents who accompany them, who the, which the program as well offer them opportunity to develop their skills and knowledge uh, in academic or even short courses or even learning, just learning the language. Um, now, the aim of this scholarship, not just to send students all over the world and bring them back, gaining academic knowledge uh, only, but um, to interact with the local community, gain experience, uh, get engaged in learning the culture as well. So, for instance, I, may, I will limit my talk to Canada, for instance. Um, we encourage our students uh, to take uh, volunteer jobs while they're doing their degrees. And we even give them merits awards for those who achieve um, this goal of uh, serving the, the, the community where they live in. Um, knowing that interacting with the local people will get them exposed to different way of lives and different way of thoughts and this will help them when they eventually go back home to be able to understand and tolerate uh, others, people, cultures, and way of life, and to prepare them to get engaged in um, cooperation with other nations, which is another aim of the scholarship program. That is to even connect institutions where our students study in to their counterparts in Saudi. So. Um, our office in Aroa not only uh, administer uh, the scholarship program, but try to build uh, bridges between Canadian um, research centers uh, and universities with their Saudi counterparts. We've been trying over the last five years. Uh, we are seeing now more and more uh, positive results where collaboration in the academic and research front 
are being taken place between Canada and Saudi. Um, last Saturday, we celebrated uh, the graduation of 750 uh, students from Canadian institutions in all levels of degrees. Um, the Minister of Higher Education was present and he commented uh, uh, to us as in how many students do we have in the um, French-speaking universities. And we told him we are trying to build bridges and try to encourage students to approach uh, 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 French-speaking uh, universities. And then um, he commented, he said, okay, now we have 16,000 students mainly going to English-speaking universities. So let's see, let's, let us double that number by sending these uh, more students to the French-speaking universities. Um, so um, the scholarship program not, does not limit itself to a certain um, uh, language, for instance, uh, or culture. So we have students currently in China, Japan, Singapore, India, Pakistan, uh, of course the States, Germany, France, Canada, and on and on. Um, there are 32 cultural offices around the world. Uh, their aim not just to promote the scholarship program or administer the program, but even to build, as I mentioned, collaboration, partnership, with the academic institutions and research centers. Um, my talk is, um, is printed outside and uh, you could um, have access to it. And I think it's gonna be posted in uh, the forum uh, website. But I will end by uh, mentioning that um, uh, Saudi Arabia has uh, identified um, eight major research interests um, that we are trying to connect um, Canadian institutions and research centers um, with these, um, with their counterparts in exploring these areas of interest. And mainly, if I go uh, read them very quickly, um, mathematics, water, oil and gas, information technology, <coughs> physics, electronics, uh, space uh, uh, technology, uh, petrochemicals, biotechnology, energy, environment, and nanotechnology. I think I'll stop here and thank you for so much for your attention. Thank you, Yaya. And now, Philip, the view from Austria. Yes. Thanks, Madam Chair, for inviting me. Thanks for, to the organizers for giving me the opportunity. I have to say, I am not based in Ottawa, but in Washington, D.C. And from there, I cover also Canada and always enjoy the opportunity to come to Canada and uh, learn about what's happening here in the field of science and technology policy. Um, we all know that developed countries, especially also in Europe, have a problem, have a debt problem, and, and I think the only way we can uh, face this challenge is to out-innovate ourselves of that debt. And this is also um, what the Austrian government is doing, and I would, now, I would like to come back to some points Pierre and Bob made in the previous session. Uh, about what the role of government is when it comes to research and development. And I prepared some points, but I just would like to raise three. One is education, one is R&D spending, and the other one is networks. We also heard about facilitate, the facilitator role of the government. So, education. Austria is not, does not have a lot of natural resources. We don't have oil, uh, we have a little bit of wood, but uh, our people uh, is basically the only thing we have. Therefore, it's... Uh, I would say the most important task of the government to, uh, to educate our young people, to prepare them uh, to compete on a global scale. Um, R&D policy, uh, the Austrian government already since, uh, I would say the last decade, has invested heavily in R&D. We had a level about, of about 1.9% 10 years ago and reached uh, last year 2.76%, which is about the same as in Germany and uh, the US. Uh, just a couple of months ago, the Austrian government uh, decided its new and actually first uh, innovation strategy is called becoming an innovation leader. Um, within the European Union, Austria currently is considered as an innovation follower behind the leaders, as we heard, which are Sweden, <coughs> Finland, Germany, and Denmark. And until 2020, Austria uh, 
would like to become an innovation leader itself by increasing its R&D investment to 3.76% of GDP. This is just numbers and this is just part of it, but I think it's, it shows the commitment of not only the pr uh, pu uh, public sector, but also the private sector to do something in this area. Um, the third point I would like to make is networks. We have a lot of uh, Austrian researchers who go abroad. Mainly, to, mainly within Europe, but also to the United States and Canada. And this is also an area where I focus uh, some part of my work. We created a network of Austrian scientists in North America. We try to stay in touch with them. We try to inform them about uh, opportunities that are back home. We try to uh, support through these, uh, through these activities research collaborations. Uh, and one of our Austrian scientists in North America is Peter Peter Matcher from, uh, from McMaster University. And through him, uh, he established a very good collaboration with the uh, TU Graz, Technical University of Graz. And this is, I think, the kind of uh, support the Austrian government or the go governments in general should, should promote. Uh, provide the right conditions, provide uh, a good education to, it, to the people and then let them basically make something out of that. Uh, and and I, I will be happy to work with McMaster, to work with Canadian universities to increase this transatlantic cooperation. Of course, Austria is part of the European Union and uh, partner within all the activities that happen in the framework program, in infrastructure programs. Um, and, and, and so this is, I would say, the way to go. Um, I think I limit my comments to this. Okay. Just one last observation. Uh, this panel and the last panel, I think they were only males, so uh, government R&D policy seems to be a man's world. Thank you. <laughs> um, thanks, Philip. Okay, uh, moving on to Patricio. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks to McMaster University for this opportunity. Um, I'll try to keep it very brief. And uh, well. I'm from Chile, and I'm here to talk about Chile, obviously, and trying to make a connection that is meaningful to the subject that we're addressing today. Uh, you know, other countries have spoken. I'm here representing a, 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 a small uh, developing country with a good record, you could say, with a, uh, some fairly well-grounded ambitions and, and uh, some challenges in terms of development and uh, basically to do good to its people. I'd like to divide my time uh, very briefly in three areas. One is uh, state of the art. What is our situation regarding research and development in Chile? What the government is doing and uh, what are we doing together with our Canadian friends? Uh, the first part, um, Chile has good fundamentals for a small developing country that is aspiring to become a developed country by 2018, knowing that we are a developing country and we have some big challenges to, to face. Um, Chile um, has good uh, science productivity for a Latin American country. Uh, we have a low level of research and development expenditure. We're talking about 0.4% of our GDP compared to, for instance, 2.3% of the OECD, of which we are a member country. Um, we have uh, a low level of investment in uh, research and development by businesses, and this mostly goes to science, I mean, to engineering and technology. On the other hand, on the other hand, the, the state tends to invest mostly in agricultural sciences, which is not a surprise if you are familiar with our productive structure. And again, uh, most of uh, R&D funds in Chile come from the government. Um, also, research and development in Chile are highly centralized in, in the main city, Santiago. We have a situation there. We're a 15 million country with a 6 million people capital city. There is a little bit of an imbalance there. And, um, and there is also not a very high degree of collaboration between industry and universities in, in the area of uh, research and development. Now, uh, we are at a crossroads when it comes to our future development as a country. As I mentioned, we are aspiring to become a developed country about, by 2018. And this, this will require a significant effort to enhance productivity, innovation, 
and uh, to uh, diversify our economy. Uh, we're talking about a need for sustained growth, uh, ideally 6% a year for the next seven years, and the goal to double our um, RD investment uh, by 2018. In fact, the government is trying to accelerate that and do it by 2014, mostly through uh, tax incentives. Two key aspects in this challenge, uh, human capital and competitiveness. Um, Chile needs to become an innovation-driven uh, economy. We need uh, um, to improve uh, innovation in the private sector, and we need to also improve uh, coordination and uh, human and, and human capacity in order to better make use of, of sig significant, uh, significant funding that the state has been providing uh, for a few years now in the area of uh, research and development and. Um, for the first time in Chile, we're talking about billions of dollars going to this sector, but as somebody mentioned here, maybe it's not the amount of money, but what you do with it. So that is a, a, a challenge <coughs> for our country. Now, the role of the government, um, the, the government had to identify our weaknesses and um, provide a uh, way forward, and uh, that has been done. Uh, the government created a vision for um, innovation, they also the government created a strategy, which is uh, you know it's out there. Uh, this strategy, not surprisingly, comprises um, clusters, which again are closely related to our main uh, economic sectors: mining, agriculture, uh, food industries, and and the like. Um, Funding was necessary and is being provided, and also to create the tools. And all this needs to fit our particular case. Um, I think it is very relevant that we discuss our experiences and learn from each other, but obviously whatever Chile does needs to fit our very particular reality. Um, so what's the government uh, doing in terms of uh, facilitating uh, uh, the uh, increase of research and development and uh, to create an international linkage. Um, uh, first of all, uh, there are new funds providing money. Uh, there is uh, an effort in uh, bringing in uh, centers of excellence to stimulate the creation of networks of um, incubators and accelerators, and not only uh, uh, within Chile, but obviously uh, abroad. Um, there has been an effort in uh, improving human capital, uh, stimulating technology transfers, and definitely uh, stimulating uh, global connections, uh, networking. Uh, a couple of tools that I will mention very briefly. There is a program called Becas Chile, Chile Scholarships which uh, started in 2008 and aims at uh, training 30,000 Chileans abroad in areas of um, advanced knowledge. Uh, there is also, as I mentioned, specific funds to uh, support collaboration of Chilean researchers with uh, foreign research institutions and um, uh, also to develop networking. Um, there is another uh, tool that I wanted to mention here, uh, which is called Startup Chile, which is a, 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 a very new program aimed at financing uh, entrepreneurs, bootstrappers, who have an idea, and basically the government of Chile is telling them, telling them, come here, we'll finance you for a year in order for you to start your business, to develop your idea. And what Chile wants to uh, obtain out of, out of this program is uh, international exposure, to become known, to create networks of, of innovators. Uh, there's been a, a, a very good response, and I'm happy to mention that in the latest intake of uh, projects, uh, Canada became uh, the second country after the United States in terms of uh, you know presenting projects for Startup Chile. 
Now, uh, to conclude in just a minute, 30% uh, of uh, the uh, uh, Chile scholarships have been granted for Chilean students to come to Canada, which is a very good indicator. Um, looking at what um, Chile and Canada do together in terms of science, uh, the areas are interesting. We're talking about public health, uh, biotechnology, agriculture, and this is what we perceive of the consulate. This is the kind of Chilean scientists who, or, or researchers who come to Canada. We see the doctors, we see the agriculture specialists, but again, it's, it's individuals. It's, it's, it's one-time situation sometimes. It's, it's nothing uh, massive. One interesting thing that we discover is that, um, that Chilean and, and Canadians tend to look up into the sky together. One of the areas that there is more collaboration between Chile and Canada is in astronomy and engineering linked to astronomy. As you probably know, Chile is uh, uh, the uh, location of some of the largest uh, telescopes in the world. So at least Chileans and Canadians look up to the sky together, which is a good thing, I guess. Um, we have the government, the Chilean government, together with the Canadian government, have been able to provide uh, instruments. We have agreements specifically for science and technology. We have, uh, um, there are programs uh, going on, but always more is needed. And um, I want to conclude by saying one thing that we uh, realize, that in the end, it's all about information. Uh, Canada is the largest investor in Chile today. Obviously, uh, mining is, is the key element there. And uh, it's, it's, it's a very quiet relationship. It's huge for us, and, I, and we believe it's important for Canada. But it is very quiet. And um, when it comes to things like, OK, uh, there are Chilean um, uh, researchers who would like to go abroad. For some reason, Canada is not always the first idea in their minds, independently for the obvious excellence of Canadian institutions. So we believe that one of the things that the government needs to keep doing, our government, the Chilean government, and, and obviously the, the private sector, is put information out there. The means may be available, uh, but the, the information is something that seems to be lacking and that we need to address. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patricio. Okay, so back to the province of Ontario for the last word. And then I am going to steal a minute or two to invite some questions, either from the floor or uh, from the panel of other panel members, or of any of you from uh, the previous panel, because this is closing our discussion now on, on the role of government. So I know that a number of you stole a break uh, between the last two sessions, and so I'm going to steal a minute or two of the break to, um, to allow a couple of questions. So that gives you some time to, to think about uh, uh, some questions for the panel or the previous panel. So, Bill. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so, you know, this being about the role of government in international R&D collaborations, I think we've heard a lot yesterday and this morning about, and certainly in this country, the provinces are pushing hard on science, on technology, on research. The federal government is doing the same. And we have a lot of those you know, really, uh, really important, and I think doing a, a really good job of creating those conditions around um, pushing science and technology as, a, as an economic force. Um, so, you know, I think gov governments are pulling their weight, is, is a simple conclusion. But I want to link this back to a number of comments that I've heard, and, and, and I know my, my boss, who was sitting here uh, about an hour ago, talked about the regional economy, and, and, and I, want to, I want to pick up on that theme. Um, because I think uh, there has to be a strong, or I, I think there has to be a more local purpose to this international, to, to this whole notion of international collaboration. And it's much like the journey that we have been on with our, with our universities and colleges, but, but, but certainly in spades with our universities about, um, the universities have a very cherished role around education and research, but more and more trying to link them to the local economy and the growth of the local economy. And the international collaboration is a, is a really important feature to that. And um, whenever, <coughs> whenever I get asked to do something, um, governments come up with big ideas about what they want to do. They, they, they look to a guy like me to make it happen. We always ask ourselves the question, how do you mainstream this? When you tack something on the side or you make it a little program on the side, the impact might be good, but it's certainly not optimized. 
how do you start to mainstream international collaboration um, you know, as part of the whole research mantra? And I think we benchmark very well and we're doing that. Uh, my next question is, how do you actually turn that into stronger and more clear, yes, economic benefit, social benefit, environmental benefit, health benefit uh, in the local economy? Because institutions are so connected to the rest of the world, I think they have a special responsibility to spread those connections throughout the community to try and get those economic and other benefits. There's a really good little picture on page five of the, of the program here, which I think is, is, is really what I'm trying to say. It says, McMaster University, your door to the world. Um, and it talks about innovative education and research. I think that door, that door needs to also be for you know, local small and medium enterprises who need to compete globally, who desperately need those international connections, and universities need to play a very strong role in helping to aid and abet those connections, not just in research but in other areas through their, their global connections. So uh, at the end of the day, this is not, uh, as much a call to action as it is a comment. Um, I, think, I think we need to I think we need to spend as much time trying to understand the local benefit that these wonderful international institutions can bring to, uh, to, to, to the province. Thanks very much. Okay, okay well thank you Bill. Uh, we've heard uh, from this panel some very diverse opinions um, from big science to um, getting emerging economies uh, started up. And uh, so I, I do want to give you the chance just before we close this discussion on the role of governments and move to a very important discussion on the role of industry to give people an opportunity to ask questions of the panelists or of the panelists to um, you know, further their own discussions with each other. So were there any? Um, yes. Would I you like to introduce yourself? Yes, just I'm Jessica Robin from the National Science Foundation, and I um, appreciated your comments, Tom, about large facilities, and I think this links to what Leo and both Patricio had talked about. Um, large facilities, I think, is, is an area that definitely needs to be looked at further, not just for the large facility itself and the research it brings, but what it can do for emerging economies. I know with, with, with Chile, certainly, Certainly astronomy has played a huge role in your economy with the observatories, which brings, I think it's close to $1 billion of, in, of investment. And it seems that that's an area, and you've recently had a workshop looking at sort of innovation and how to use s and to do that, modeling after the um, astronomy community. I, I'd like to hear from some of the other community, uh, the other countries in terms of what can be done further. I mean, and this speaks to the, the last speaker as well. It seems that a lot of money are going to, 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 to different countries, and we need to tap into that and coordinate further. So was your question around uh, how big science can impact on, on the developing countries? Is that is part of? Regional. in that region, okay. Would anyone like to? <laughs> There's actually been some, you know, as you would expect, some research on this topic, and, and um, it, it actually illustrates one of the things that I, I think will be a challenge for, for, for smaller countries. Obviously, in the case of telescopes in Chile, you have a huge geographically driven advantage uh, that, that has led to that development, uh, you know, southern hemisphere high altitude. Um, if you look at the, the analysis of the impact of large facilities on the local economy, and, and this has been done by CERN, for example, and, and in Grenoble, where there's some major European facilities, of course, what you see is even though these are uh, international efforts, they have even requirements in terms of the distribution of expenditures uh, back to the nation states in the form of contracts, there's a very disproportionate local economic impact, as you would expect. And what that has led to is this idea of uh, host premium for hosting a major international facility. So for example, with ITER, 45% of the cost is borne by the EU as the host country because the disproportionate economic benefit will fall uh, to the EU. Um, that makes sense, and it works if EU is the host for ITER. Uh, 
doesn't work so well if, say, Canada had been the host for ITER, as was proposed at one state, since I don't think Canada is prepared to be a 45% partner <laughs> in a $20 billion undertaking. Um, and, and I think this is another one of those, those unsolved problems. It can be an engine for economic development, which can certainly benefit a developing economy, really give a, a boost to a, a local high-tech sector. Uh, but if there is this concept of what's called just retour built into the model, it won't happen. Okay, Philip. <laughs> just a brief comment. In Europe, we have the so-called European um, Strategic Framework on Research Infrastructure, ESFRI, and, and that's a, a forum within the EU where all the member states agreed on a list of, I think, 40 uh, research infrastructure projects which are in the interest of the whole EU, and then the member states can discuss uh, where to host it, uh, who, who would like to join. That's not choose the tour, but uh, you have just to chip in and then it's built somewhere. Austria, for example, participates at the project in Darmstadt in Germany. And a last comment, uh, I'm proud to announce that Austria is now also a member of the European Southern Observatory in Chile. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't want to be too disrespectful of time, but we do have one more person I think has been patiently waiting. So if we can quickly have a question and answer. Go ahead. It's Roland Hussein and, um, from GE Canada. Um, you know, Tom, you, you mentioned um, you know, big science, and every single speaker touched on one particular topic, and that is nanoscience, nanotechnology. And, um, and so the concern is that if there isn't, and yesterday the Indian speaker mentioned that no one country can do it, and yet every country, every university is doing something on nano. And so if an area needs a lot of collaboration is on nano, because society is going to benefit tremendously from nanotechnology. But there's going to be one blocker, and I think for governments it's important to, to recognize it, and the blocker will be ecosystem effects and health effects of nanomaterials. So if one area needs a lot of collaboration, it is in the impact of nanomaterials on the ecosystem on, 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 on public health. 